So on behalf of the Niagara Lake Public Library, I'd like to welcome all of you to our second gardening workshop, Dig in the Dirt. The first one was Dish in the Dirt. If you missed it, you can find it on our YouTube channel. If you go to the library's website, that was really interesting. And I am so happy that Betty uh, agreed to do a second one, a follow-up one for uh, this time of the season. Um, so I just like to, uh, a few, um, I guess, uh, what, I'm, trying, I'm losing the word, uh, instructions. They were on your, on your email, but um, just, I just like to go over it one more time. So if you are watching and you have this, um, you see that we are sharing the screen. So to custom, you can customize your screen. And if you aren't familiar with Zoom, the best viewing is if you click on the view options, which is at the top of your screen, you choose side by side mode. And that will make the screen share customizable. Um, you click on speaker view and then Betty will be the person that you see, unless you wanna see all of us in our lovely rooms or whatever. But if you wanna just see Betty, that would be where you wanna go, speaker view. And then you'll see a divider that sort of runs between the video feed and the PowerPoint presentation. You can move that side to side and make the screen, the shared screen, larger. So you'll be able to see the graphics and her slides better. Um, Zoom has a lot of options. So that's just what I find is the best for viewing uh, these types of workshops. Uh, like I said before, please remain on mute. Uh, ambient noise and all that can be distracting. And you are welcome to keep your camera on. You can also turn it off, whatever it, you are most comfortable with. If you need to get a hold of me, if there's something wrong with the feed, sometimes uh, I, I don't notice necessarily, please use the chat function. That's also along the bottom. There's a little uh, text bubble. You can text me, um, chat with me, and I'll hopefully be able to see that. And we will definitely have a time of Q&A at the end where you can ask your questions either via chat or if you feel comfortable, you can, we can do it in person directly to Betty. Um, and the best way to get our attention if you have a question because we are such a large group, sometimes we can just go like this. Down below along um, the toolbar, there is a little icon with the word reactions written under it. It's a little emoji. You click on that and you can have, you can give us all kinds of reactions, but the one at the bottom says raise hand and then that will pop up on my screen and I'll see that you have something that you want to ask. That's probably, that is the easiest way to get our attention and hopefully we'll be able to get to all of you because I'm sure you'll have lots to talk about at the end. Okay, so before we get started, let me introduce our special guest and tell you who is going to be presenting to, for us today. So wait a second, I was gonna admit one more person. Okay. So Betty received her BA in criminology at the U of T before starting a 10 year career in estates and trusts in one of Toronto's big law firms. She was also in the military, the Naval Reserve at HMCS York. Fun fact, apparently Betty is pretty good with a machine gun and can jump out of perfectly serviceable aircraft. I have heard that story, it's amazing. And maybe she'll share it with us today. I don't know what that has to do with gardening, but why not? Um, after her third child, she stayed home with the kids. She volunteered in their classrooms, ran a composting club and a gardening club and fell in love with teaching. Betty went back to school in her early forties and did her B.Ed. at York University, graduating at the top of her class. She taught elementary school in Mississauga and trained teachers in Sierra Leone, West Africa. She created school gardens wherever possible and ran her share of garden clubs with the students. We are very lucky here at the library to have Betty on our library board. She is a strong and passionate advocate, always willing to lend a hand and contribute ideas. Her drive for social justice is inspiring as she constantly looks for opportunities to improve the lives of people here and the rest of the world. And I know that doesn't speak anything about, to anything about her gardening prowess. Um, she is a master gardener, gardener in training, something that she um, achieved during COVID. And I think, I think she didn't get a chance to talk about it in the last workshop. So I'm hoping that she'll talk a little bit about that as well tonight. So 
without any other delay, I leave it to you, Betty. Welcome. Thanks, Betty. Um, and good evening to all of you good citizens of Niagara-on-the-Lake. Uh, thanks for Zooming in with us tonight. I, I'm glad you want to talk to us about soil and the importance of understanding what we're doing when we're planting our garden. Um, the library, like many institutions in Niagara-on-the-Lake, likes to start off its gatherings with a land acknowledgement. We thank those who have honored the land before us. But then what do we do with that land now that we are on it? Um, we all, I think, can answer that question personally for ourselves, but I'd like us to sort of dive into that a little bit and just look at how we can be stewards of our land by looking at native plants and looking at what is invasive on our land. Um, so we don't know what we don't know. So let's learn some, let's laugh some, and let's enjoy some company as we go digging in the dirt together. We are very fortunate to live right here. We live in the warmest part of Ontario. Um, Niagara on the Lake shares that honor with the Windsor area. Um, Canada has nine temperate zones um, for gardening purposes. The zones were changed in 2010 um, when they acknowledged that the world was getting a little warmer. So we're a zone 7A, which means we can grow things that zone 6 and 5 and 4 may have more difficulty growing. Um, so it just gives us a little more latitude in what we're able to to plant. Now, we're different than how the United States does it. The United States looks on an average annual minimum degree to come up with their zones. But Canada, of course, we have to be different than the States. So we look at minimum winter temperatures, the length of frost-free period. We look at our summer rainfall, maximum temperatures, snow cover, and wind speed. So anytime you are researching a plant on the internet, make sure you're looking at what the Canadian zone is and not the American zone, because they will be a little bit different. So lucky us, we are in zone 7A, and that gives us a frost-free period of about 190 days. Um, the grape growers would say it's a little bit longer than that. So our average date for our last spring frost is April the 25th, so last week. And it sounds like it's early, but we have often been able to plant that early in this part of the world. So what does that mean? So the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs says, this is our frost free date. 50% of the time, there won't be any more frost after the end of April. There's a 25% chance that there's risk, risk of frost seven days after that, which would have taken us to May 2nd, and 14 days from the April 25th date, the risk of frost is only 10%. So that's where we're sort of sitting right now. Um, we've always generally looked at the Victoria day long weekend, but because we're in a zone 7A, we can actually start digging in the dirt a little earlier than that. So keep an eye out on the, uh, on the spring. If you look down the road the next 14 days, it still looks like it's going to be a cooler than average spring, but there's no reason why you can't start thinking about when you're going to put your plants in the garden. This is the uh, VQA map of the Niagara Peninsula. And again, we're up in the top right corner. Um, and you can see that we do have a moderating effect from the water over here. And uh, this is where we are. And we've got the river here, the lake here, and all that moderation gives us um, a little bit of a warmer temperature. Now our soil is what's going to have a direct impact on what we can grow and how we can grow it. We are living on the floor of the Pro Glacial Lake Iroquois. It was created by an ice jam at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River um, about 13,000 years ago. So, you know, if you ever thought traffic jams were bad in the GTA, well, this was a 13,000 year traffic jam. So we're situate on a very old lake bed. It's got thousands of years of plant deposits and animal deposits on it. 
And this is what has created the fertile, albeit clayish soil that we're all planting in. So what is soil? Soil is 25% air. Plants need air just like we do. It's about 25% water because they need water as well. And the mineral component is about 45% of your soil mixture. The organic material, there's my dog with her squeaky ball, um, the organic material is about 5%. Now, the mineral that's clay, silt, and sand is the rock component of your soil. The 5% organic material, that's the exciting part. That's where the micro microbiome of your soil is. That's what's going to make your soil healthy. Um, and it's going to create that healthy environment for your plants to grow in. So this is what's going to feed your soil structure, feed your microorganisms, and all the little insects that make up the balanced ecosystem inside your soil. So that's what the soil composition looks like. So what are we digging in in that soil? Well, Niagara region tends to be largely a clay-based soil, and you may have seen, remembered this if you saw my last um, workshop. So soil texture is the sand, the silt, and the clay that makes up your soil. Now, if you were to say, well, what's the best kind of soil to grow in? Well, the best is about 20% clay, 40% silt, and 40% sand, and that's called loam. And that would put you sort of over in the uh, sort of middle bottom part of the uh, triangle over here. Um, but most of the world is not that perfect soil, and yet most of the world is able to grow plants. Um, so understanding that we're largely a clay-based soil, and that's okay. How to identify what your soil is in your garden? Um, if you take a, a glass jar, fill it up with about that much soil, fill it up with water and give it a good shake, let it sit for about 24 hours, and you'll see the sand, the silt, and the clay components of your soil in your part of the world, um, and that'll give you an idea of what you're working in. Now, if you want to see what your soil is like under the ground, this is a great new sort of COVID thing that's happening in the garden world. It's always been out there, but school children are being encouraged to try this at home now. And it's actually citizen science because uh, farmers across Canada are gathering this information. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your um, white tight, your white underwear, 100% cotton, men's underwear, well, I guess it could be women, and you're going to bury it about six inches into your soil. And you're going to bury it completely, leaving a little bit of the uh, elastic waistband sticking up above the ground. And then you're going to know where it is. And in about eight weeks, so two months from now, you're going to dig it up and you're going to hope that your underwear looks closer to the right-hand side of the picture than the left-hand side of the picture. Um, because that will show you that the microbe in your soil, all those little microorganisms that your plants need to be so healthy is alive and kicking and, and uh, eating and doing what it needs to do. So again, we live in the Niagara Peninsula. It's such a special part of the world. Um, we're in a Carolinian forest and we're, we're mostly deciduous plants. We're in the deciduous forest. Um, with a really high biodiversity of species. Um, if any of you know Owen Bjorgen, um, he runs some great programs, Owen's Hiking Adventures, where he can take you out into the Carolinian forest and really show you how alive it is. And here we sit with wa the warmest average temperatures in Ontario, the longest frost-free season and mildest winters. Great Lakes um, temperatures are moderating our our environment, and we've got this beautiful soil to plant in. So let's look at what those native plants can be. So what is a native plant? A native plant simply is a plant that has been here before European contact. It includes mosses and wildflowers, shrubs and trees, and they are adapted to the growing conditions where we live. 
they've been growing in this soil that we just talked about, and they're, they're very comfortable growing here. They're adapted to our climate, so they can pretty much take care of themselves, and that's why they grow so well. Many of them are perennials, so that you'll enjoy them year after year. And a little bit of maintenance here, a little bit of maintenance there, and they pretty much sort of do their thing. So a native plant is one that has not been introduced by us. It wasn't brought over on a ship. It wasn't snuck through airport security. It just grows in this near area naturally and has been here again before the Europe, before European contact. And that's sort of the uh, um, line we use to describe what a native plant is. It's also very much a chemistry thing. Because when you're growing native plants in your garden, you're getting more than just pretty plants. You're getting all the native pollinators and other wildlife that go along with those plants because they attract native pollinators. And you realize how much planting this way supports our ecosystem. And if your plants aren't nibbled and chewed and have a few holes in them, then they're not part of that ecosystem. Native trees provide the types of cover and food sources that native fauna require to sustain their life. And these species are integral to holding together our larger natural ecosystems. And uh, as such, it's a, it's a nice symbiotic relationship between the two. You know, Elton John sings about the circle of life. Um, and that's really what you have in a native um, environment, because when you lose your native plants, we lose the native animals. You might have a beautiful, pristine garden, but you're not going to have that beautiful ecosystem that we want to strive for, again, in acknowledging the importance of our land. So if we're planting native plants, we're attracting native pollinators, they're having their native babies in our plants, and then the birds are able to feed those to their young. Because it's not enough to just say, well, the, the pollinators are getting pollen from our plants. They also have to get the insects to feed their babies. So it's all a real balance in the ecosystem. So the big significant difference here is native plants support native insects and we need we can't have one successfully without the others. Um, there have been a lot of studies recently about the decrease of birds in our communities and it goes back to the again the ecological connection between the plant world and the animal world and that has a direct effect on the bird population. Native plants will attract more native um, insects, and that's what the birds again will come and uh, have dinner on. So one of the things, I, so now we're going to say, well, well, what do I plant? How do I know what I want to plant in my garden? How do I know what's native and what isn't? Well, the uh, Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority has put together this fabulous, fabulous document. And after this talk, um, the library will send out to you a copy of the different documents I'm going to talk about so that you'll have the links and, and be able to research it yourself. But this document is about 92 pages long and it covers all of the native species, how to plant them, where to plant them, and why you want to plant them. So here's part of the index and you can see it talks about your location. So you have dry soil, you most moist soil, normal. Is it shade, not shade? What do you want to plant? Wildflowers, shrubs, grasses. And it breaks it all down and offers you options. So you want to plant a white flower that's native, that's going to bloom in the early spring. It tells you what, it's, what your options are in the under the white column. So, and it does this for each month. So you can choose your month and your color of what you would like to plan in the type of sun and the type of soil that you have. So my example here is if I wanted to plant something, a native plant for normal or moist and shady conditions, it's going to give me a list of plants that I might choose from. And they've got pictures that go along with them. So I can 
have a, an idea of what's going to actually go in my garden. So not only are they going to give you a list and some pretty pictures, they're also going to give you a detailed description of each of those plants. So if I'm planting, if I say I want to put in some jack in the pulpit, it's going to tell me what the habitat is that it likes. It's going to describe that plant for me so I have a good idea of what it's going to look like. It's going to give me a picture. And then it's going to give me the wildlife value, either a high, medium, or low value to, excuse me, to the plants uh, or, or to the pollinators in our, in our environment. So it's a fabulous document from that point of view. Um, one of the issues that we have in the Niagara on the Lake area are our black walnut trees. And a fabulous, fabulous overstory tree but they do produce something called juglo. Now, the word for what's going on there is allopathy, and that's a biological phenomenon in which an organism produces chemicals that affect the growth and survival of other organisms around them. So people will think that nothing grows under a black walnut tree because the black walnut tree produces juglo, and it's in the nuts, and it's in the stems, and it's in the roots of a black walnut tree. But there are actually a lot of native plants that do grow under black walnuts. Remember, the black walnut is a native tree. It's been around for a long time. So of course, there will be things that grow underneath it. Um, so these are different um, plants you can plant successfully under a black walnut. And I'm going to ask you to remember that word allopathy because it's going to come up a few more times in our talk today. So non-native plants. So we now know what native plants are, and we've got a really good document that we can refer to to um, help us plan adding native plants to our garden. And I'm not suggesting you pull out everything in your garden and put in solely native plants, not at all. I mean, we all love our geraniums and our big, beautiful flowers that are non-native. But non-native or alien plants doesn't mean that they're um, not appropriate for a garden. No, to enjoy them, absolutely enjoy them. But if we can add a few <clears throat> native plants here and there in our garden, we're doing a favor to the ecosystem around us. So there's various de definitions, but at its most basic, an invasive plant is an alien species whose introduction does or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm, okay? or harm to human health. But not all introduced species are, are um, harmful. Um, and most of our agricultural crops are non-native as well. Um, and then you can say, OK, well, if the world is just bringing different plants from different parts of the world, eventually we're all going to just be a homogeneous world where all the different plants are everywhere. So are invasives really a problem? Well, if we have a homogenized world, um, what's the problem going to be? Well, we're choosing winners and we're choosing losers in the game of life and they'll sort it out from themselves. Well, Debbie, you have a quick survey you're gonna do for the good folks of Niagara-on-the-Lake. Do you want to throw that first question up for them? All right, give me one second. So the very, you want the first one? Yeah. Okay, there it is. Does everybody okay. see it? Ooh, this is the, my officially my first poll. So I'm very excited. Yeah, I'm excited to do this too. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> it's always good to learn new things. Okay. Peacock Festival. So that's where I picked that one up for. <laughs> okay, yeah. so it's going to give us. So there you go. Do you have periwinkle or English ivy in your garden? So 60% of us say yes, and 40, 39%. percent oh, hang on. People are still, they're figuring it out. Hang yeah. on. We're almost there. We'll all learn together, right? We're going to have to sit here until everyone's answered. No. <laughs> Okay, so there you go. We've got about a 60 40. Yeah. yeah. So let's, let's, re let's remember uh, that. So that's okay. it. Here, take it off. Take it off the screen. Bam, there we go. Okay. 
So just want to keep that in the back of our mind. Um, if we plant native plants, will the pollinators show up? Yes, they will. Pollinators are a keystone species. They feed on nectar, the pollen of the flowers. The flowers bear the fruit, which is eaten by the songbirds and other animals, and that includes us. Um, the numbers of invasive alien species have risen about 70% um, since 1970. And ecosystems, wild populations, local varieties and breeds of domesticated dogs and animals are shrinking, deteriorating, or vanishing. Um, the quote is, there are multiple um, causes for this decline, changes in land and sea use, exploitation of organ organisms, climate change pollution, and invasive species. So the bottom line is that no one really knows the long-term impact of species redistribution, but the philosophical question to ourselves is, is it up to us to displace or eradicate so many other species when we, that we share on this planet? So if we do plant for our pollinators, they will come. So when planting for your pollinators, when putting in your native plants, these are the things to consider. Be patient. It takes time for native plants to grow and it takes time for the pollinators to find them. Be sunny, because everyone loves the sun, including the pollinators. Be homey. Leave little piles of brush around for them to nest in and be aware, really observe who is coming to visit your garden and where they are visiting and what time of day they are coming. And be chemical free because chemicals are not good for any of us. So you, when you can look at all these different places that bees live, you think of hornets up in nests or in our eaves troughs, but no, most native bees live in the ground. And this little guy in the middle, this is my little Fred, that's my pool shed. And there he is covered in pollen from my garden, um, heading back into his home. And if you look carefully, you can see my um, reflection in his bottom as he's trying to get back into his hole. But you can see that most bees live in the ground. Um, they, they've got little, um, cavities that they live in here and there. And uh, we need to be aware of that. And we've talked about not moving things around in the spring and, and leaving your um, detritus on your garden so that these pollinators can wake up and get out into the world and into your garden. Um, Muhammad Ali said, um, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. But bees are gentle and most bees don't sting. It's only the females that have an attitude. The male bees don't sting at all. So you don't need to be afraid of them. And notice where they come and what time of the day they arrive. Um, I have a big patch of, of vinca, a periwinkle between myself and my neighbor. And uh, I went out looking the other day and just watching for the bees to see what they would do with it. They would have nothing to do with the periwinkle. They went from flower to flower and just went, eh, nah. Eh, nah, eh, nah, and kept going. Um, and again, periwinkle is invasive. But my non-invasive plants, I've got um, some non-invasive bulia and the carpenter bees, the hoverflies, um, hummingbird moss, were all over it. Um, very, very busy and active. We also have to be, when I talk about being chemical free, the neonics, um, type of, of um, pesticide kills bees. And yeah, and I'm just gonna leave it there. We just don't wanna do that. Um, science is showing that we're losing bee colonies um, dramatically and not just honeybees, which are non-native bees, but it's having the same effect on our native bees as well. So plant as many different native plants as you have room for, tuck them in here, tuck them in there. Um, a goal might be for 50% of your property to have native coverage. Now, coverage doesn't mean percent of plants, but rather coverage. So I have a very mature tulip tree on my front lawn. It takes up about 40% of the front of my property. So that would be 40% coverage in that one tree. 
Whereas if it had been a magnolia tree, it would have been 0% coverage. So it's just uh, um, not per plant, but coverage. If you can get your coverage to 50% and ideally eventually up to 70%, that would be a wonderful goal. Because let's all look at our lawns. We're told we wanna to have beautiful lawns, but they are the ecological equivalent of a dead zone to wildlife. There's nothing there for a pollinator to eat. So let's have a, a two minute um, history lesson and the history of the lawn. So in early medieval settlements, the villagers had a right to have a common green where their livestock, could, they could bring their livestock to graze. The English word loud means a glade or an opening in the forest. So that is where the word lawn comes from. So the aristocracy did the same thing. Um, they left space around their castle for their animals to graze, but it was also an era where there were lots of wars. So it was a good way to see if your enemy was approaching. You kept your loud, very low cut, um, and you could see the uh, bad guys as they started to show up. It also said that I am wealthy and I don't need to grow crops here because I have other land that I can do that. Um, when Versailles was um, designed at the end of the 17th century, um, the green carpet was introduced. And that was the first time a large lawn like that had been introduced, strictly ornamental. Um, and it was mowed with, by gardeners with scythes. And then the French, uh, everybody wanted to copy the French king. The concept spread across Europe and then eventually to England where it became more of a natural looking um, lawn as opposed to the very formal French lawn. Um, that idea was to show that landowners could devote a lot of land to aesthetics um, as opposed to eating off of it, again speaking to their wealth and their power. Um, lawn mowers were invented in the 1830s which led to lawn games for the masses which brings us back to that lawn at the front of your house right now that you are watering and fertilizing and spending money on, that is an ecological wasteland for all the pollinators in the hood. So something to think about. Um, remember, male bees can't sting and most bees don't want to. Okay, Debbie, you've got another pollination question for us. While she's putting that up, uh, I pulled up all my grass this year and I put down micro clover. Um, so I'll have a property that's about 120 feet by 250 feet deep with not a blade of grass on it. Okay, so Debbie, you've got a, there we go. You know, it's interesting, we don't know what we don't know. And it's always fun to discover things and find that aha moment where you go, oh, okay, this is interesting. Um, so what is a pollinator? A pollinator is something that takes the nectar, the pollen from a plant, from a flower, and just goes around from flower to flower. And it's essentially um, taking the male part of the flower, introducing it to the female part of the flower so that the flower is gonna go on and produce seed. And look at all these native plants. Yay, Niagara on the lake, look at us go. Um, pollinators aren't just bees. They're wasps, they're ants, they're beetles, they're spiders. There are many different animals that can pollinate our plants. Okay. So now let's look at invasive plants. A non-native plant, that, so remember native is here before the Europeans. So a non-native plant is introduced into an area for horticulture or agricultural reasons or by accident. 
Now, as even though many of these are fine for our gardens, some of them are ridiculous. And those of us who have said yes to English ivy and periwinkle have some of those horribly invasive plants. Now, I like my garden plants and they are the problem in my garden. And that's a comment we hear time and time again. But what plants are invasive? How do we know if a plant is going to spread from a garden to an ecosystem? How quickly does that occur and what are the impacts? So many questions, so many questions about what invasive plants are and what they do. So it's not invasive in my garden, so, so what's the problem? You know, we, we all recognize, especially in this community, um, Phragmites, that's a, a really big issue here. Garlic mustard, Japanese knotweed, but what about periwinkle? It's so pretty. And what about lily of the valley? It smells lovely. It's, we use it in our soaps, in our perfumes, in our candle. In candles, English ivy, oh my goodness, it covers an area quickly. Look at the shots all over around the, the, um, around the garage area, around the parking pads, it's beautiful. Well, the problem is that these are creating monocultures and wastelands for our pollinators. Um, you can say, well, I go into the nursery and, and I can buy those plants there. Um, many of, yes, many of the nurseries do sell invasives. Um, and I went in and I asked Maury about this a couple of years ago, and their comment was very telling. It was because people buy them. Um, I was in Cole's Nurseries this week, just sort of looking at what was around, and uh, they had a whole section of invasive species. <laughs> they didn't call them that, but they were all grouped together, and I thought that in itself was, was quite telling. Um, do we have an obligation? Do we have an, a personal obligation as stewards of the land so that a thousand years from now, if they're doing a land acknowledgement to us, that they can say, we are good stewards of the land? You know, I don't know what the answer is to that. I guess it's a very personal one. Um, but we, we do need to be aware of what these invasives do to our, to our land. So the first, there are four categories, categories of invasives. And the first one is called transformers. Invasives, they tend to be able to reproduce really quickly from seed and vegetatively, and they increase their populations very rapidly. Um, the rate and scale that they, that they grow are very, very quickly, which is part of the reason they're called a transformer. But they're also called a transformer because of what goes on below the soil and what goes on above the soil. Um, transformers do not attract native pollinators, so you're not going to see the native bees and things around them. Under the soil, they are changing the soil again um, so, that other, so that native plants are not attractive and they take hold. It's the alleopathy thing again. Because if you've ever um, looked at periwinkle closely, I'm going to use that as an example because so many of us have it. I mean, it's a problem from Australia all the way through Canada because it's jumped the proverbial fence. It's pretty, it's evergreen, um, it grows in difficult areas, you don't have to mow it. Um, and those are good things. But do those good things outweigh the bad? Periwinkle produces by stolons, and so it's very, very hard to remove. So I was out in my garden today, and I have got every invasive species around. So there is the periwinkle, and you can see the stolons here. And every place that it hits the ground, it roots, and it just keeps on keeping on. And that's part of the problem of, of the stolons. So it's very hard to remove. So small fragments can start up new colonies. We don't get all of it out, out, all out right away. And it's evergreen, right? So it catches the sun, which sounds good, except in the early spring and through fall, it's shading out all your other plants, especially your native plants and especially your ephemerals. So you've got these dense mats forming and your natives disappear. 
And again, it's aliopathic, as we were talking about earlier with the jug lung. And it's also a little bit poisonous. Um, it produces about 50 different alkaloids, and uh, it reduces the number of native bugs that come around, but does increase species of wolf spiders. So if you like wolf spiders, periwinkle is your guy. Um, there you go, the periwinkle. So what are you going to grow instead? Wild geraniums, beautiful, fragrant as well, similar to your lily of the valley, honeysuckles, large leaf asters, ruby laced honey locusts to take the places of the invasive species that are similar. What is a highly invasive species? So we've talked about transformers, which are actually changing the native populations and changing your soils. But what about a highly invasive species? And in this picture, you probably see some of your favorite plants. You've got Scylla, or Squill, you've got your Lily of the Valley, your English Ivy, and your wild roses. These um, naturalized alien plants cross a line to become invasive when they start modifying the native communities and growing in these super thick masses so nothing else can grow. You look at this picture on one hand and you say, oh, that's beautiful, that blue scylla, until you realize there's nothing else growing there. Again, you've got a monoculture. So that's why I want to encourage you to select native species, some native species, um, to deal with these aggressive spreaders. And when you're going into your nurseries, perhaps you can speak to those nurseries about why do they carry um, invasive plants um, so that you can avoid them wherever possible. Again, you don't know what you don't know. So you've got something called um, invasive. I'm also hearing a lot now the term weedy. Um, weedy isn't exactly a selling feature. So if someone says to you, oh, this is a bit of a weedy plant. Well, you know, it's gonna spread quickly and you probably be avoided. The dip, a non-native plant can be invasive. A native plant cannot. A native plant can be aggressive, but it can't be invasive. We've got wild ginger, which gives a beautiful little burgundy flower. We've got um, a rose carolina instead of the multiflora rose. Starry Solomon seal is a beautiful, beautiful alternative to lily of the valley. And prairie smoke sort of broke the into or the gardening internet last summer with some of the beautiful pictures of what the uh, prairie smoke flower looks like um, up close and personal. So you've seen that even though they are transformers and even though they're um, highly invasive, most of us will have a periwinkle or English ivy or some of these invasive species living at the valley in our gardens. So what about moderately invasive? I mean, Creeping Jenny up in the top left corner is a lovely plant spilling out of a basket. I mean, it's the classic spill of the thrill, of the thrill, fill and spill. Burning bush is outstanding in the autumn. That red fiery color is very attractive. Its branches have a really unique winter look to them. And they're both lovely when they're contained um, in one spot. But when this happens, it's not so great. And this. So here you've got burning bush in the forest. And you'll note that there's no other species growing on the forest floor. So where do you begin to remove this stuff? When you see it, start from its outer edge and work backwards so that you're prohibiting it from going further into the environment and you're just slowly working backwards because it's, it can be hard work removing all of this. So start with small sections so you don't feel overwhelmed and target the worst spreaders and go after them first. These are all Canadian. Um, they're beautiful, fragrant, 
and the advantages of things like the service berry, the uh, shrub on the right hand side, and it's flaming red. Um, it's got beautiful white flowers on it in the spring, it attracts birds for the blue fruit, and then you've still got the uh, burning bush red thing happening in the fall. And then we've got the, mini, the minimally invasive. So these are the plants that are working their way up the ladder to become invasive. So we all, we're all familiar with the common orange daylily or the ditch lily, what a lot of people call it, calls it. And when the daylilies showed up in conservation lands, as they have done in Ontario, they flagged as problems. But how much of a problem depends on a lot of things. Um, we often plant ditch lilies because they fill spaces quickly, they look pretty, they last a long time, you can change, uh, trade them with your neighbors, but this just continues to perpetuate the problem. There are a lot of other daylilies you can purchase that are um, non-invasive, they're cultivars, and they come in tons of different colors, and they're not going to do this. Because again, you're not going to have the native pollinators and you're creating a monoculture. And you do stuff like that. So instead, um, let's look at, at the coneflower, the Michigan lily. Now, the Michigan lily is not a day lily. This looks more like a tiger lily, if I can use that word. People often use the word tiger lily for a day lily, they're not the same thing. Um, the foam flowers, the Virginia water leaves, the black-eyed Susans. Black-eyed Susans are just a beautiful August pop. We should all have them in our gardens. So this is the next brochure I'm going to encourage you to spend a bit of time with. Again, Debbie's going to send it out as a link in an email to you. Um, it's the Grow Me Instead, and it will say, okay, here is a... Um, an invasive plant, plant this one instead. And it's uh, the brochure goes through all the invasives and suggests to you alternatives you can you can plant um, instead. Um, there is an uh, there is an Ontario Invasive Species Act, which and its goal is to support the prevention, early detection, response, and eradication of invasive species in Ontario. So it's just good to know that the uh, is an act to try and get that under control. Okay, let's talk about weeds for a minute. Um, I'm sure you've all heard the expression that a weed is just a misplaced plant or a plant is in the wrong location or, or something like that. Um, I'm hoping by now we realize that that just doesn't quite hold water anymore. And in fact, it's, it's one of those gardening myths that old wives tale. Now, I don't know if old wives' tale are old wives' tale or an old wives' tale, but anyway, we look at it, um, weeds. Um, here's a few cute quotes. They know, they just know where to grow. They know how to dupe you and they know how to camouflage themselves along the perfectly respectable plants. They just know, and therefore I have concluded that, that weeds must have brains. Or how about this? A weed is a plant that has mastered every survival skill except for learning how to grow in rows. But my favorite is that weeds are nature's graffiti. So we're gonna look at four um, invasive weeds um, that we have a real problem with in our part of the wood. Um, garlic mustard. So, I pulled this plant out of my garden an hour ago. So this is a garlic mustard plant that has grown since the snow melted. It's one plant and there's its root, which I got most of it out. And its flower heads are starting here. And these flower heads that this one plant will produce will give you over a thousand seeds. Now, garlic mustard is two years. The first year, you're just going to get a little green plant, like you see in the top left um, picture. And the second year, you're going to have what's at the bottom picture. 
And each one of those plants can have a thousand seeds. And the seed bank, a seed bank is how long those seeds will stay viable. So a seed bank on garlic mustard is about 10 years. So you want to get them out and want to get them out quickly. If you don't have the time and the energy to dig them out because it's a big tap root, at least cut the flower heads off and you're going to reduce your seed bank. Creeping Charlie or ground ivy. Um, I, I'm like, oh, I'm not going to have any of that out in my garden. But of course, I go have a look and there it is. And there's its root system. So it's just absolutely knotted. You have to really, really work hard to get these stolons out. So stolons means it creeps. And everywhere it touches the soil at each node, these are each called a node, it's going to um, take root and it grows very, very quickly. If it's in your garden, you can zen yourself and, and work at it for a year or two to get it out. If it's in your grass, move way easier. Creeping bellflower. Um, some people think that this is a lovely plant for your garden until it takes over your garden. Um, and I was confident I didn't have any of this in my garden um, because I've been very careful, but I did buy a couple of plants from the nursery last year. And sure enough, there it is. And again, you can see the stolons running along the runners and then it has a taproot. Now this has only been in the, my garden for half a year, but the taproot has started and it goes deep and it goes wide as you can see from the bottom left picture. And again, it's producing thousands of seeds and runners every year. Lesser saladine or fig buttercup. Ugh. If you look at the picture in the top right hand corner, that's a picture someone in the Niagara region posted this week um, saying, oh, they weren't able to garden for health reasons for the last couple of years. And look at how the buttercups took over and isn't it beautiful? And she tried to pull them out and she couldn't. Oh, well, she was just going to plant her geraniums in pots from now on. That property has been absolutely nuked by the stuff. So here we have lesser celadine, which I unfortunately was able to dig up in a ditch. And you can see all the little nodes on that. This stuff spreads like crazy. Um, you leave a little tiny one of these nodes. So you leave this in your soil and you're gonna have a plant like this before summer's over. Um, and it's really, really difficult to get away with. Again, away, away, get away. Um, you can see the root systems on this stuff is just awful. It's very pretty. It's very, very pretty. It's often confused with marsh marigold or buttercups. But this is a, this is a monster. It's a devil spawn. Um, and then just a quick thing about milkweed. So milkweed used to be considered an invasive species. It was considered a horrible plant because it was toxic to cows. Um, but at the same time, it's mandatory for, for monarchs. So, Invasive can be a very complex thing. The Ontario Agriculture Ministry has recently taken milkweed off the invasive and noxious lists because of the monarch butterfly. Um, and farmers have just been encouraged to keep it out of their field. So there really is this balance between what is and what isn't. And then of course, when we're out enjoying all of our outside walks, um, physically distance apart, apart from each other, um, don't take any invasive species home with you, um, on your shoes, on your clothes, just sort of be aware of what surrounds you. Um, the bees and the butterflies, again, these are just different plants you may consider. I'm going to whip through this quite quickly. I think we're pretty much closing in at the end of our time, um, but the different um, plants will be available on the slideshow, which will be archived with the library. And again, they're all listed in the documents that um, Debbie will be sending you um, at the end of this, this um, workshop. So to sum up, do an audit of your garden, 
where do you get your sun? Where is your shade? What is your soil like? Have a look for the invasive plants that may be growing there. Try and remove them if you can. Learn what your native plants are. Spend a bit of time with these documents that you'll be getting and then decide where you want to begin. It's not going to happen overnight, but every step counts because you can change the world, not the whole world, but the part you touch. And so start touching it with your garden trowel. Thank you very much, everybody, for, uh, for joining us. Um, Debbie, thank you. Remember that our library is a great source of gardening information. There's a well curated section in the library of books you can take out, of magazines you can take out. Debbie's showing you a few of them right there. Um, you can, there's magazines through Hoopla um, and a subscription form for your library. So uh, make a point of, of checking out what it has to offer. Um, and yes, this is the COVID era, but as I was reminded this morning, an optimist says things couldn't be better, all things considered. A pessimist says everything could be better, all things considered. And a gardener says, plants? <laughs> Thank you so much, Betty. That was awesome. So inspirational, really. Um, I've got a few questions here on the chat. So let's go through those. And then if you, anyone else has something they would like to ask, make sure you put your hand up. Your virtual hand would be great. So um, the first question comes from Janet and she asked, why do invasive plants smother native plants? Oh, hang on, you're muted. There you go. My husband might say that's me at my best. <laughs> um, very good question. Um, invasive plants grow quickly because they don't have that. Um, I mean, I'm going to back up one little bit. Native plants are in a symbiotic relationship. It's a give and take relationship where everything is around it. An invasive comes in and it doesn't have the normal checks and balances it may have in Eurasia or China or Japan or wherever uh, the invasive has co initially come from, from Europe. Um, and so it doesn't have anything holding it back. So it gets in our soil and it grows very, very rapidly. It's invasive because it's rapid growth, because it transforms the soil um, by actually changing the micro microbe in the, in the soil and it attracts different pollinators and non-native plants do not attract native pollinators. Thank you. Um, oh, you mentioned uh, the name of a highly invasive plant. You showed it. I think uh, this is from Estelle. I think it was the one in the forest. Um, I want to say Lucilla, is that what? Lucilla, yeah, it's a little bulb. Um, it's come and gone now here, and uh, it is beautiful. And uh, yeah, it takes, it grows so quickly. It produces little bulbs. It also produces seed. Um, and seeds are trans, um, are, are carried around um, by wind, by ants, um, and you'll have something pop up five feet away from your initial colony. And uh, off it goes. Yeah, blue scylla. Squill. It's also called squill. Um, but the blue scylla is the invasive ones. There's camassia, which is part of the same um, family, but not as invasive. Debbie, Debbie, yes. Debbie, you've got one more question you were going to ask people. I forgot to ask. Oh, right. You. Toss it up. Pop it up. Because it's about pollinators and which of these is not a pollinator. It's a good one. I, mean, I told you that ants are, that bees are, and wasps are, and Ooh. spiders are, and beetles are. Which one of these is not a pollinator? Well, this is fun watching it in real time. And the lemurs go, 
heading off into the first place, followed closely by coyotes, then lizards, and then possums. So the correct answer is coyotes. Coyotes are not pollinators. Lizards pollinate, lemurs pollinate, and possums pollinate. Hmm. Not all in this part of the world, but around the world, yeah, coyotes don't pollinate. Although that lovely white koi wolf that's hanging around in Old Town will eat your veggies in your garden. Um, it might look at your cat with a, a wink twinkle in its eye, and certainly after the rabbits and the squirrels. Um, but the coyotes will eat your veggies too. Thanks, Deb. All right, a couple more questions. One second. All right. What are your thoughts on bee houses? Do they work? Should we install them in our pollinator gardens? Oh, really good question. And I'm probably not the best person to ask about that. I'm sure there are bee people out there who would have a better answer. But this is my understanding that they're very good as long as you can keep them clean. But there is a fungus that can get fungus or bacteria, might be a bacteria, excuse me, that can get in um, to the back of the house and infect all the bees. Um, but I, that's really all, all I got on that. Okay, that was Julia. She stumped you last time too. <laughs> I have Julia's uh, answer for her. We just haven't chatted. <laughs> And uh, one more question from Julia, uh, lesser celandine, is it the same as winter aconite? No, it's not. Really good question, Julia. Winter aconite is one of the first um, um, ephemerals to come up in, in the gardens. I'm just looking to see if I've got a picture of the winter aconite. There is the lesser celandine. I don't know if I'm holding this up in the right place for you to see it. Um, and winter aconite's not on here, but no, they're they're they are a different, different. Winter aconite can be aggressive, um, but it's not invasive, and it's one of my favorite favorite plants. But they're very different plants. Both bulbs. Okay, we've got a bunch here, Betty. Um, hang on. Is it easy to find these plants in local garden centers? Oh, really, really good question. I was actually trying to find um, a list of native plants stores to put up for you. And that's the reason I, I went to Coles. They have a few. Um, um, Sunshine really didn't have much. There are two in Hamilton, um, the Ontario um, oh, what are they called? Ontario Native Plant Store. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get that information. I'll send it to Debbie to send out to you. It's, they're not easy to find. So do keep asking at your nurseries for them. Um, people will say, oh, they've got them at Loblaws. Oh, oh, they've got them at Lowe's. So, you know, hey, that's great. Um, but it's really something you've got to look for. Okay, what are your thoughts on mint and lemon balm? Um, mint is great in a mojito. Um, mint, grow it in a pot, grow it in a pot. I um, did a little experiment last summer where I took a piece of mint. We had friends down the street who moved, they had been farmers and they moved out of town. They gave me some mint and I took a piece about that big and I stuck it in my garden. I put the rest in the pot because I wanted to see what it would do. My goodness, by the fall, the roots on this thing were like this. So I pulled it all out. And it's, I've got a garden full of it again this spring. So um, yeah, mint, grow it in a pot. And lemon balm, same story, grow it in a pot. Can you take a moment to review what you said about the property coverage? I think you mentioned 40% with sure. native plants. Sure. Um, the literature will say aim for 70%. I, I just find that can be a little overwhelming for people. So I say, well, let's start off with 50%. If we can get 50% of the coverage of our garden, not each plant 50%, 
So if I have a native tree, if I have a sugar maple that covers a huge part of my garden, there, I'm, I may be there already. It's the coverage because you're attracting the native pollinators. So it doesn't have to be 100 or to, let's say 50 plants. We just want to cover 50% of the garden with something that's native. And a tree canopy will do that. Does that answer your question? It wasn't but my question. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> it answered my question. I find that no, I find that fascinating. It's not like 50% of the plants you plant, it's 50% of the coverage of the coverage. space. Right. Yeah. 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 Think Very of, clear. Think of it as a, a of a, a drive-through restaurant, right? So come on in, bees, help yourself. And uh, the more native coverage, the more flowers they have. Um, yeah. No more coverage. That's clear. Uh, mulch. We talked a little bit about this last mm. time, but uh, yeah. I think people are spreading mulch now. So is mulch good or bad for the ground soil, generally speaking? Thoughts on mulch? Oh, mulch. I love mulch. Mulch is wonderful. But I'm going to back up to compost quickly. So if you're going to put mulch down, if you can, take a minute and put down half, a, half an inch, an inch of compost really nice mature compost first. To the macro eye, when you look at compost, and it's this beautiful dark stuff and it's so good for my garden. Yes, put it down on your garden. To the micro eye, that compost still has a lot of decomposing to do and it's gonna take it another four or five years of breaking down all the nutrients in that compost so you're putting a four or five year vitamin pill, if you will, on your garden. And then you're gonna put mulch on top of that to keep down the weeds and to keep in your water. So those are the two things that mulch does really, really well. And then mulch will slowly break down itself to become essentially more compost, to make that beautiful, rich soil for your garden. So yes, mulch is a wonderful, wonderful addition to your, to your garden. You think of the forest, the leaves fall down, it's a natural mulch. Um, so what are you gonna mulch with? Well, you can use leaves, um, just put them through a shredder first, run them over with your lawnmower. Um, pine and cedar are my mulches of choice because I like the smell of them. Arborist mulch is free. So when the town comes around, takes down some limbs because they're hitting the garbage truck, when the garbage truck goes by and they put them through the shredder and you've got that freshly ground mulch, it's free, it's called Arborist's Mulch. Ask them to dump it on your driveway, spread it around, it's great. The problems you might have there is there might be emerald ash borer, there might be gypsy moths. So it might be a good idea to have an idea of what tree they took down. You can get colored mulches. You can get mulches that are dyed black and various shades of brown. You can get mulches that are dyed red. The dye isn't the biggest problem. They say it's vegetable dye, but they'll never tell you what the vegetable dye is. But the dye isn't the biggest problem. The bigger problem is what is the mulch actually made out of? That mulch is usually um, crap wood. So it's um, old pallets and it's pressure treated wood and they grind it all up. It's stuff that would have otherwise gone to the dump. They grind it all up and it looks awful. So they dye it and then they sell it to you as mulch. So uh, those are your options. Um, yeah. And not stones. Don't use stones as mulch. They might look pretty initially, but a few things. It's weight. So it's compacting your soil. And if you remember from earlier, a soil, soil is a good, healthy soil is 50% or 25% air and 25% water. And if you squish all that air out of it by compacting it or putting heavy stuff on it, your soil isn't as healthy. So don't use stones um, as, as mulch. You'll also get weeds growing up through them. And we all have better things to do than weed, weeds out of stones. Thank you. Okay, what is the safe way to get rid of Japanese beetles, which ate all of my roses last year? Yeah, shooting them is not the best thing. 
Japanese beetles. Um, well, people will say buy those pheromone traps and hang them, and people will swear by them and say, yeah, it got all filled up. They're so awesome. Except you've got to think that a pheromone trap, what it's doing, it's calling all the beetles. So you're bringing the beetles on your property and the beetles on your neighbor's property and the beetles down the street, they're all coming to your pharaoh trap. Um, Japanese beetles hose them down, um, shake them off into a bucket of soapy water and drown them. Um, those are your best, best uh, options. Again, stay away from chemicals because as soon as you start spraying, you're not just spraying the bad guys, but you're also spraying the good guys. Okay, last one. Okay. All right. So from Michael, where can you buy micro clover? And are there any hints you can provide on using it? Absolutely. Give me one second. Okay. West Coast Seeds are where I got my micro clover from. Um, it's called Pipolina, which is the type of clover. Can this, is this in the, can you see this? Yes, it's in the camera? Yes. Okay. Yes, I can see it. Um, okay, so West Coast Seeds, it's Pipolina, um, is the micro clover. West Coast Seeds gives a very detailed instructions on their website about how to plant a clover garden. Um, my, it needs full sun. My garden, or my, what used to be lawn, is full sun. Um, it died last summer, so I decided to try this instead. So I've left a few patches of white clover there. White clover, we all see it in, in the lawns everywhere, and it does give you that little flower, um, and bees are attracted to it. So you have to keep that in mind that white clover will attract bees. Um, Minor Brothers sells white clover behind the counter. You can get it there. The micro clover is about a third the size, the leaf of, a, of the micro clover, and it doesn't give you all those flowers. Um, you probably have to mow it three, maybe four times this summer initially just to get it growing, hugging the ground, and then you're good. Um, and it needs very little water because micro clover fixes nitrogen, and that's what your, your soil needs, and that's what's giving you the green is the nitrogen. So it, it fixes nitrogen in the soil because it's a legume, it's not a grass. And on, the Ontario Seed Company sells it as well. And you could also plant it with your lawn. Um, the um, down in Old Town, they one of the parks. They planted um, grass and the micro clover together, so it's less um, mowing, and uh, you're also getting that nitrogen fixation in your soil. Yeah, Voices of Freedom. That's where it is. Voices of Freedom Park. If you're ever down there, have a look at the grass there. Interesting. That was great. Um, I don't have any more questions here in the chat. Does anyone have anything that they want to ask in person? It's, it was a great presentation, as well, always. Had, Very inspirational. Well, I had so much fun. I'm going to go wet my plants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I need to okay. plant something first, but that's, yeah. you'll have to come down and do that for me. But Absolutely. thank you. So um, thank, thank you everybody for coming uh, on behalf of the Niagara on the Lake Library. Thank you, Betty, again. So it just makes it, yeah, motivational and inspirational to get out there and do something and this is exactly go what we need. Knee. Yeah, go get your knees dirty. Absolutely. Go play in the dirt, make some mud pies while you're at it. Thank you everyone for coming out. It was nice to see all of you and hopefully we will, um, See you again soon. Keep an eye on what the library's got to offer and uh, maybe there's something else that interests you as well. And hopefully Betty will come back. Growing Let's season is long. Absolutely. <laughs> Always something to do. All right, Enjoy. with that, I'm gonna say good night. Bye-bye everybody. <laughs>